Welcome to a community built of tomorrow's business leaders. Hey guys, I'm William Freitas and this is the Socius Podcast. Socius, welcome back to another episode. Today we've got Mark Zimmerman from On The Mark Coaching. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's great to be on the show. Thanks for having me, Will. I'm excited to talk to you specifically about what it is you do at On The Mark Coaching. And I know there's some incredible stuff that you're up to, right? So you've coached some well-known names and some well-reputable brands. So um, let's dive into, I guess, very briefly, a little bit about what you do with On The Mark and a little bit about you. Sure, absolutely. Um, On The Mark Coaching, actually, I think it was founded in 2018. Um, I decided to hang up the corporate boots around about... Um, I think a few years before that, um, because I, I started studying coaching, I was really intrigued with the psychology of how teams work. And um, teams themselves in the business context and sporting context, because I fundamentally found that there was um, toxicity within cultures, mm. which bothered me a bit. So a pathway for me to go back into those workplaces mm. and roll up my sleeves and say, okay, right, What's going on here? Why is there a high turnover of great people who come and go? What is the, the culture like when you look underneath the bonnet of this business? Mm. Um, what is the leadership team? How are they engaging? Do they understand their roles? Do they understand their values, their company's mission and vision? And I found for a large part, they struggled to answer those questions. Or if there was a clear answer, it would vary to the person next sitting next door. Yeah. So On The Mark Coaching initially was founded to become a, a coaching business that offered solutions to companies that wanted to align and, and grow their culture and wanted to create strategic partnerships for small to medium-sized businesses that were scaling up and, and, and growing um, because there is such a thing as dilution. Mm. And I find that small businesses, that especially the ones that get off to a really strong start, um, bring on more people and with that you get dilution of culture. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, we've seen that plenty of times and obviously a big part of our audience are businesses looking to scale. Business is looking to grow from, you know, the one or two people to 10, 20, 30. And the quicker that occurs, I would almost argue there's probably some scientific uh, equation to how quickly culture can deteriorate or, or dilute, as you suggested. So um, obviously there's a quite a lot in what we just, what we just grabbed there. But um, tell us a little bit about, I guess, who you've worked with. You know, I, I, sure. I know you've definitely worked with some incredible people. Yeah, look, I mean, the, the funny thing about coaching is the, the boundaries of confidentiality. Yeah, of so course. there's some, some high profile names which um, prefer to remain a, a, anonymous. I coach people who, who cannot afford coaching, but who could benefit from it. So I give up time on the mark, gives up time to help people who, who could benefit from that. Um, I, I've also coached at um, drug and addiction clinics to help people who've now finished the counseling process. Interesting. Coaching is everything really from where you are right now at this point in your life, looking ahead. What does that path look like? Mm. What are the goals, the milestones, the objectives? What is, what, 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 what is the future we're trying to create? Mm. And a coach is really effective in helping set out those, map it out, and then, and then establishing what those dots are that need to be connected. Nice, because I guess naturally there's going to be some learnings from, I guess, where you've come from to, to pull on and, and learn from, but definitely the, the benefit of coaching is looking at, you know, much like as a, a team sport would suggest, having a coach to manage your future performance. And uh, what, what do you see in terms of similarities from rugby players to large internationals to small, you know, growing teams or, you know, t talk to us about uh, that. Whether we're talking about rugby union or, or rugby league, any team sport or any business environment, I always say whether you're in the boardroom or the changing room, the common, the common theme that drives success is passion, enthusiasm, and, and, and a word that I, use, I love to use, which is mojo, right? Mm. And I think that without mojo, it's the one thing, it's 
not tangible. You, you cannot walk into a room, see it and pick it up and hold it because it's, it's an energy that flows. And again, it's an energy that flows whether you're in the boardroom, whether you're having a meeting with your team or whether you're in the changing room about to go out and perform at peak, at your peak level. Without that energy and that essence and passion, it doesn't matter what you've practiced, rehearsed, planned, you're always going to hit a threshold and, and be held back by that barrier. Mm -hmm. It's the mojo that enables you to go beyond that barrier. And quite often people get confused between mindset and motivation. And I think, you know, the best example is um, Ben Lionel Scott put a, a motivation video out on, on YouTube. And, and, he, and the example that he gives is, imagine if I said to you, Will, um, we're going to swim 2Ks in the middle of winter in six weeks' time. We're going to swim from Bronte to Maroubra. And, and you go, yeah, we're going to swim and I'm gonna, we're going to do this. We're going we're gonna to get up every morning, 5 a.m. We're going to go swim together. We're going we're gonna to do this 6K swim. It's going to happen in, in – sorry, 2K swim and happen in six weeks' time. And we high-five each other and we you get so pumped up, all right? And the next morning we wake up, 5 a.m. It's dark. It's cold. The bed feels warm and comfortable. It's hard to motivate yourself at 5 a.m., right? But it's having that, the ability to have the, that X-ray vision to see through and you keep going, yeah. everything past that point becomes resilience. Interesting. And, and so how, how do you get your mojo, right? Because um, yeah, it's interesting. I've just finished um, the, the David Goggins book, yeah. uh, Never Finished, yeah. his second one, which was fantastic. And, and there are some cool ways in what he applies as to how to get your mojo somewhat, yeah. you know. Um, you know, he talks about how you can create an alter ego and, you know, put yourself in that alter ego position and, and what that, who you want to be, right, sure. which I find interesting, but that's not necessarily <laughs> mojo, right? That's not finding yeah. your mojo. So tell us a little bit about how you can find your mojo or what are some, what are some ways that you can do that? That's a great question. I think it differs for um for most people i think it's very it's hard to apply a cookie cutter approach to to mojo because it's different different things drive different people but but essentially my my research into this topic has um i've come up with seven core elements to what drives your motivation and your your mojo right and i think essentially starting well is fundamentally something we all take for granted. And actually, how do we start well? Well, starting the day well, for example, means when you wake up. You know, for some people, it means a guided meditation as you're falling asleep at night. For some people, it could be just doing a gentle walk and, and, and unpacking the day and leaving the negativity behind before you go to bed. So I feel that um, starting well is really important. That, mm. that I'd say is fundamentally step one of how to create a positive mojo. Um, once, you've, once you've started well, I always say get the tough stuff out of the way first. There is a great sense of achievement in knowing that you've nailed something challenging early on in the day because then you feel intuitively that you can take on anything else. Mm especially if there's something that you've been putting off for a long time, let's, let's not shy away from it. You know, there's a great saying, when things don't go your way, and, and they won't always go your way, by mm. the way, um, don't shy away. Don't back down. You go on the attack, not in an aggressive way, but you attack the challenge. Let's attack the challenge that's niggling us, that we're carrying around. So that's that's the second thing. The, the to, third to, one. <laughs> sorry, just on that second thing, I'm 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 curious. I'm sort of sitting here thinking, because I've been sitting about this this week. You know, like I'm a you know 5 a.m. wake up guy. Um, get in the gym nice and early. Um, but I've been toying with the idea of training a little later, and the idea behind getting the most difficult things out in the morning. The gym's not the most difficult thing. Like I feel like I could do that, you know, like sure, it'll be difficult physically, yeah. but mentally 
it's not the most yeah. difficult thing. So I'm sort of taking a little bits element from this now and going, oh, <laughs> actually, I might change that around. And then I, I think, you know, we, we live these our weeks counting down the hours to Friday afternoon. And I think mm. that's, you know, that's, that's not the best existence to have. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, the definition for me of culture is how do, how do your team feel in their hearts and in their tummies on a Sunday night? Are they excited about Monday morning? Because if we can, as a team, create enough energy and mojo to be able to take on all the challenges that we're going to be faced with, the expected ones and the non-expected ones, then for sure we're going to be able to tackle them better. And if we're living each day, Monday to Thursday, like it's a Friday, because guess what happens when we wake up on a Friday? Instinctively, most of us who work a Monday to Friday job the spring in our step, right? I'd even put some music on when we're getting ready for the day because it's, it's, it's the start of the weekend for some people. But if we can live money that we have on a Friday, our focus and attention, our energy, the flow of everything mm. increases incrementally. And businesses can see that, by the way. And, 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 and then I guess the, the, the fourth one is we need to, I touched on it earlier, we need to plan and expect curveballs to happen because the more we can exist outside of our com comfort zone, the more we will become comfortable in dealing with unexpected curveballs. Right. And you'll find that businesses, especially businesses that are scaling, they will encounter unexpected cash flow challenges, unexpected loss of, of key team members. They will encounter, you know, growing pains as any scaling business would. I feel that if we can get into our minds that we should expect things to not always go our way mm. and we live a portion of our times outside of our comfort zone, well, we'll be able to cope with it better. And the example I can give you is there's two things I don't really enjoy. One of them is cold water and the other one is getting up too early, right? So throughout the entire winter last year, I would get up at, I think, between 4.45 and 5 a.m., and I would go down to, to Bronte Beach and I would swim in that pool in the icy cold wind um, every morning. So the two things that I felt really uncomfortable with, I tried to, well, every day I did, I put myself in that, even when I'd had a broken arm at the time, made no excuses. Broken arm, you can still put a plastic bag around it, tie elastic band, and I got into that water. So... For me, it was about building that resilience because I didn't want an unexpected curveball to stop my mojo flow, mm. if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. So we, I think, yeah. So, so we, I, I know we've only touched on four of them, but the last three, I'd say, go really quickly. Break things down into bite-sized chunks. When you're looking at Mount Everest and it seems too overwhelming, we tend to, we tend to lose our motivation. If we start with a very small win, we set a small win, and we continue to the next bite-sized chunk. What are you prepared to, how are you going to deal with these curveballs? How much do you want it, right? How much do you want it? And breaking it into bite-sized chunks makes it more palatable and achievable. Mm. And, and, and then linked to that is taking accountability for me. So now we're on step six of, of my seven of what creates mojo. As soon as we embrace accountability, we take ownership of our destiny. Mm. Whether we're a one-man band in a business or whether we're part of a team, part of a growing team, part of a business, part of a sports team. Mm. Accountability is key because that is linked to a role. And I find accountability is probably the most um, undervalued in the small business community in the sense that most business owners start a business on their own and they often don't have any accountability for them. And so I, I think it's a super important aspect because um, if a business leader doesn't have accountability, uh, I don't care what anyone says, you may not deliver exactly what your potential will that is, deliver. That is so true. And I think you've summed it up exactly perfectly well, which you know feeds into the... To the last point, once you've, once you've embraced all of those six points that I've just referenced as mojo creating activities, I think the one we 
we, we tend to forget about the most is what I refer to as guilt-free downtime hmm. because our bodies run hard at a pace and we have to have a time to recharge. Sports, professional sports people call it, call it recovery stage. Business people refer to it as like, oh, I'm going to hit burnout if I don't <laughs> slow down, right? And often it's sad because people in the corporate world, they wear it as a badge of honor almost. And they go, oh, I work so many hours this week. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, imagine this. Whether you're a team or whether you're an individual, let's call that the hardware. Our bodies are the hardware. The team is the hardware. What drives the hardware? It doesn't matter how physically strong the hardware is. Software drives the hardware. Now, when we get a brand new iPhone or a Samsung phone or whatever it is, we get all excited. We've got this brand new phone. It does incredible, it can do incredible things, but it can only do incredible things if the software enables the hardware to do the incredible things. Right? So when our phones are saying to us, it's time for a software upgrade, we've got no problem at all. Now, why should that be any different to us as human beings? When we've put out a great performance, the team in business or in sports or as an individual, we need to make sure that the software, which is actually our coming back to mind, software is our mindset. It's and so this is your, what we'd call it, a, I guess, a mojo model, right? So if you don't mind at a high level, yeah. it's the six steps? Or? Yeah, well, there's seven steps, to, seven steps. To, 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 to creating mojo and a flow. And, and then that feeds into a model which we've worked on called the MPT method. Got it. Now, the MPT method is, is we've worked on that with uh, Dr. Carol McGowan um, and from Strategic uh, Achievement Coaching. Carol's incredible. She's, she, um, she sat down with me and she said, look, you, you, you want to create a framework that will enable anyone from, from a life coaching perspective to a corporate environment to a professional sports environment to embrace a very simple model. And that model, MPT, stands for Mindset, Performance, and Team. And we've actually worked out that those three pillars, if you like, are, are molded together. There's a relationship between them, right? So the relationship between mindset um, and, 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 and I guess the, there's emotions and, uh, you know, has an impact on how we perform. Sure. And our performance has an impact on the team. And, and I, I initially, we, we summed it up like this. So mindset in, for us is underpinned by our values, our value system. And are we aligned on them if we're a team? Um, performance is underpinned by behaviors. So how do we, how do we behave towards each other in a, a professional environment? Mm. And then team, I guess, is underpinned by culture. So do we have the right culture, the mojo, that will drive our mindset to align collectively? And, and how does that then feed into the performance, the output, the desired outcome we're looking to achieve? Mm. And, and so the MPT method, yes, for sure, that is, that is a framework that we've, we're very close to um, launching. Um, and it's driven then by those seven points which drive motivation. Cool. So from a high level, if you don't mind me, if, yeah, you, if yeah. you don't mind going through them all. So mm -hmm. talk me through number one, starting well. So start well. Yeah. Tough stuff first. Uh, treat every day like it's Friday. Mm. I'm just trying to think now. It was expect curveballs. Um, that was number four. Bite-sized chunks. Yeah. Accountability and own it. And, and then the rest. seventh one was just recharge those batteries. You know, yeah, um, you have to. Awesome. And that forms part of the MPT method. Now, talk me through, obviously, naturally a huge component of that is, is team, right, yes. and culture. Now, some of the listeners might be entrepreneurs, right? How can they implement that in their day-to-day -day in their business? Owner-operator. You still need to have a, an accountant who can give you the right advice. You still need to, you may need to have... Um, someone who's in your corner when it comes to navigating the legal pathways. Mm. 
Um, you I need someone have, for insurance as well. You need to have someone absolutely for insurance. When I, I remember calling you one evening <laughs> saying, you know, we, we had a we had a big tender that we were doing, and of course the um, the requirements from Victoria government, which is who we were going to do the, to do the work with, that they had additional requirements. So, you know, at that stage, I was effectively operating as a as a single um, mm. one man band, even though on the marks got coaches in Africa and Australia. But I remember calling you saying we need additional mm. insurance. So you were in my pit crew essentially. Mm. No, I love that um, because I feel like often business owners may fall into the false feeling of feeling quite lonely. And I often f- look at so many different aspects of a business. You know, you could probably dissect the business into three key, key areas really, marketing and, and sales and then you've got finance and operations and and all three of those i guess functions the business under the, i guess the business owner if they're a solo a solopreneur will undertake however to facilitate those functions and to undertake those actions they're going to need people in their pit crew as okay. you suggest different uh, i guess occupations different professionals that can help um, but i also like what you mentioned about you know, family and fr- friends, support crew. You know, I, I don't know if that's in your method, but I can definitely see how, you know, the people you surround yourself with formulate part of the culture of which you carry on, not only in your personal life, but obviously now, I guess, an extension into your business and how you perform, essentially. You're 100% correct again. And, and I think Pit crews are your support crews, and they're there to ensure that you um, that you succeed. They're also there, by the way, to find find the holes. You know, it's very important. I often, I've, you know, we've often sat down when we're coaching um, startups, and we say to the the enthusiastic person or couple who are doing the startup, we'll ask the question, who has who has received this business plan to try and find fault with it? Like, who's the dragon in the dragon's den that you've put this into their inbox and said, find, find a hole? Who's playing devil's advocate, right? Yeah. Who's your devil's advocate? Because, by the way, they the could be one of the most valuable people in your pit crew mm. because they're going to find the one curveball that's going to hit you six months down the line, 12 months down the line, or two years down the line. Mm. Because that one thing that you remember, we said in the beginning, start well. You have to start very really well, and to st- to give yourself the best. Now that was the example of how do you start your day, but in the business context, how do you start a business well? Mm. And and I feel particularly for um, solopreneurs, owner operators, I often ask them to to look at themselves as an outsider. Yeah, w- your attitude becomes your logo. You may have a nice flash logo, by the way, but your attitude to your life brand. and your brand and the, the people you would like to be of service to, that becomes your logo. Your work rate, your work rate, your output, that then becomes your business card because people will talk about that. Mm. You don't need to hand a business card out. But people will see your actions and your mm. output. And then finally, how you inspire others around you and how you inspire people to, be, to gravitate towards you because you've got a great, um, a great attitude, well, that becomes your trademark. But a key element of when we bring it back to Mojo, um, you know, I think definitely majority of business owners are somewhat passionate about what it is that they are doing when they are you know, setting it up. And I appreciate we've got the seven methods of how to bring some mojo back. Um, But what would you say to, I guess, some business owners who have probably fallen out of love a little bit of what it is that they're doing or don't quite know if they're doing the right thing right now? What would you say about to them as how can they get their mojo back? I I always start with when did that, when did you lose your mojo? So when you are creating a business plan and it's all about this wonderful idea that's going to make everyone very happy and change lives and change the world, at those early stages, 
you're energized by the concept of what you're doing. As soon as you start getting into the numbers and cash flow projections and reporting on, a, on, on your management accounts mm -hmm. and you're reporting to lenders, investors who are part of your pit crew, that can be quite um, energy, right? What does the cash in look like? Why is it out of kilter? What does the, the, the profit and loss look like for the last quarter? Are we on track? What's the what's the PL forecast look like? What's the balance sheet look like at the moment? So I think to I would say to any person who's experiencing that, that is a normal part of business. Because it's in it's un unfair to ask of anyone to be a hundred percent in love with an idea a hundred percent of the time. Because invariably, as humans, we're going to look at something and go, this doesn't look right. Yeah. Where has it gone wrong? How do we fix it? And then we get that thrill of having overcome the, the challenge and we're back on track again. Yeah. So for periods of time, I think any business owner will realize that not every day is a honeymoon. Absolutely. And, and obviously, Mojo is going to help with that mindset aspect of the MPT method. Um, now, what we often hear from clients and other businesses out there, you know, that your team will never be as vested in the business as the business owner is, which I think is a little crap. I think that I is all stemming down to the culture that is built within the business. We can go on and talk about ownership culture, you know, until the cows come home. But what do you think the missing ingredient is when a business owner feels like their team aren't buying in? When they aren't, they, they haven't got the mojo, they haven't got that passion. What do you think the missing ingredient is? I think the answer to that is, is a far bigger answer than what, what even a question is. <laughs> um, the, the interesting thing from my experience is I, I always ask business owners, how do your team behave when you're not there? Is there a difference? Because if your team behave a certain way, when you're in the office or in the work environment or, or around them, if it's sports, if they are different, you know, what, what does that owner bring? Mm. Negativity to the table? So uh, to answer your question, I, I think that missing piece is consistency. You know, we hire people who want to be open, honest and transparent and we very much view it like it's not work and life balance it's an integration of the two and so true. who you are in the workplace needs to be the same person you are out you know will we um we run another business and there's there's i think there's 12 team members in in that business it's it's outside of the coaching um area and we to this day we say to everyone there's a couple of values that we don't even need to put in a frame on the wall. These are values everyone understands. Family comes first. So no one should ever feel guilty about having to type an email to say, I need to take some time off. And the best way to create a culture where that person can take guilt-free time off at short notice is for everyone to have a level of understanding around each other's roles. So you need to bring structure into your business which means policies, procedures mm -hmm. need to be documented, right? Mm -hmm. So that if someone's off today and something important needs to take place, well, we, can, we know exactly how to step into those boots. We'll never be able to fill the role as, as, as smoothly, but at least the business continues. So family first is a value, right? And I think that that, that feeds into the culture. And... I can't speak highly enough about how important it is for people to know that they've got that flexibility, right? Now, in, in a sporting context, it's slightly different because you're a professional sports person, but I'm talking in this context in, around the work environment. Mm. I mean, for me in the sporting context, if we sort of sum it all up in terms, it's so important for a player to, one, have their mojo, you know, think about why it is that they first started playing rugby or whatever sport it might be, because often when it becomes a paycheck, it becomes less passionate. Um, and getting more connected to that is super important. But when you think of team culture, you know, you might have as much mojo as you like, but if the rest of the team in the shed does not share that mojo, then there's a real, uh, I guess, misalignment. 
And, and, and we all know there's the old saying, I mean, everyone, everyone, it's become an overused saying, but are, are we a, a champion team or a team of champions? And, and really what we try to do is, is we use the MPT method to create um, champion teams. And for me, that means that we have to, we have to align, we have to be, have alignment. We have to have an alignment on, on, on expectations, on behaviors, on disciplines, on culture, um, and work rate. Because th then you form a team that is, we're all on the same page. Mm. If you've got a star striker in, in, in football or soccer who feels they only need to turn up on game day because they're the striker and they're going to score a hat-trick every time, but they don't feel they need to invest in time in practice, well, that's not necessarily the right way to build a strong team culture. Mm. Um, so I, f I feel yeah, there's so many examples of where of how we can enhance culture in the sporting context. That's an interesting one too, because in, a, in rugby union, I feel that there's there's different phases to creating a consistent culture. It, there's on the field and off the field. Number one, how do we behave and engage with each other when when it's practice time, when it's game day, and how do we engage in our personal lives? We're all leaders at the end of the day. Leadership begins within. How do, do we turn up on time? Do we turn up with baggage, you know, mental baggage? If we do, do we leave it behind in the, you know, off on the side of the field? Because that, it does, mm. there's no place for it on the field. And, and so I feel particularly with high-performance teams, and, and this is a topic that I really, you know, we touch on it. I co-authored a book called Winner's Mindset, and we, we really get into some of the nitty-gritty around particularly in team sports, high-performance sports, what is it that makes one player an important part of a team that can operate and function at its peak optimum level consistently? And, and, and for some, you know, I coach at grassroots levels. I, have, I coach uh, kids with special needs at the under-11 age group right the way through to um, players who are being selected to play for, for, for their country. And the theme is always the same for me. Right? The, journey, the journey needs to be mapped out. What, what, is, what are all the stations that this train needs to stop in at? So those, are, those might be milestones. And, and, and be, we begin with the engine mark. Where, when do we get off and go, right, well, that, that, that to us was success. That's, that was a great career. And then we, we look at it again. What comes life after professional sport? Because mm. that's yeah. the one that no one thinks about, right? Well, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, we, we some time ago had uh, Luke Rickardson on the show and, and we're talking about how what rugby league were doing to sort of help with professional athletes so that that's something we could, you know, definitely continue talking about. But I think my, my biggest takeaway is that the MPT method is helping build champion teams, not a team of champions. And I think that's super important. And um, I think every business owner can be listening to this and, and using your seven point method on how they can grab their mojo back and make sure they use the MPT method to scale their business. Absolutely. And that's why it was created, you know, with the help of, of someone who's got a doctor, doctorate in psychology, one of the top coaches, you know, life coaches, business, 30 years in, in, in business coaching. So, so we, we've, we think we've nailed this method and we feel that it, it is a tool that will help, you know, entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, you name it, whether you're a whether you established CEO of a company, a startup, whether you're a rugby coach, any sporting coach, or whether you're a player, the, mm. the MPT method, mindset, performance, and team, there is something within that model for absolutely everyone. We have a website. Um, we, as I said, we've got teams in, in, um, in two countries rolling out into five more. Um, but essentially, the Australian website is uh, www.otmcoaching.com.au. And if you have any listeners um, in Southern Africa, it's uh, otmcoaching.co.za. And within the next six to 12 months, we anticipate opening up, um, having teams established in the UK, Canada, US, and New Zealand. Awesome. Love, love to see the growth, mate. So yeah. fantastic to see. Thank you again for coming no, to you. share the MPT method. And um, I'm excited to share this with, with well, the Thank the, you. It's been great, great to be on the show. And I have to say it was 
big shoes to fill when I looked at and then I've listened to your previous guests and you've had some outstanding guests and, and I feel that what you're doing is, is, a, is an incredible contribution to helping people. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Will. Socius, thank you for joining us today. Please hit the subscribe button if you've enjoyed this episode. And if you'd like to be part of the Socius community, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn to stay in touch. Cheers.